Okay. Oh, yes. What is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, I got that too. What's this? Oh, I see the bottom. Oh, I got the table card too. And what's this? Band aid? I do the band aid slow down, okay? Be gentle. Yeah, baby. Do you have a tan gloss on? 
things alone. Mr. Cop with his wardrobe treating me. With a teddy bear? They look like heart, yeah. Well, that's great. So, what was it like? Um, it was fun. Um, um, see, um, the, um, the, um, the mad, the mad hatty, the mad hatty made this hat, the mad hatter made this hat for me, and the rabbit, he made this, and he had it cut together, and he's going to put some bears on it. And, um, this is my party. Is this Bridget Lino's party? Yeah. Yes. Um, I got myself taking my picture and the rabbit in the background and the bear in the
up a tree easily, but coming down is much harder. They may fall. Over right here, this is our bed table, okay? For maybe my sister if she comes in later on. And <laughs> perfect head, just perfect fit for her. Right over right here, this is my bed chamber. And know why it's mine? Because see, right in here are the weapons I guard. Ready? I'll show you them. Right here. Watch. We have, oh, first let me get my flashlight. See, right here, this room, is an extra room. But it's for it, for you want to get your pillow when you go to sleep, or um, it's to make the plans for attack. We also keep some stuff in it. Okay. Now, go up in here. Turn the flashlight on. Um, I have an M16, and I have this, which I pretend holds a lot of bullets for like things, but I really don't. Then I have another machine gun, but it's not quite an M16. And I have an Uzi. It's another machine gun, but see, it's smaller than all of them. It's a different kind. See, there's different kinds of machine guns. But here, I have a rifle. It's one of those ones that you cock. Okay. pairs of these and they're handcuffs. You get the bad guys. Okay? Now I can put these back. Be very cautious about them. Okay? We be careful with guns. So this is mainly the army base for us. And all this stuff is bulletproof, so it's very high tech. Okay? And I couldn't have had this fort done. I could have never done this fort, this whole entire fort. So if I couldn't have done this fort. There would have been no, no point in doing this fort if I didn't have this person. There's no, no, there would be no reason to do this fort if I didn't have this person. Oh, this is my little brother. He likes to like just look at the forts. But see, there would be no reason doing this fort without her because it was kind of stupid having a one-man army and all. But I like it. One bed chamber. Look at him. No. On the face. <laughs>
Guys, here's another ball.
See, what's gonna charge you something, Bill? I charge you forty dollars. If I charge you forty dollars, you might as well go back to the dorm. You're not going any place tonight. <laughs> no, you gotta spend the accident, but you just gotta. We can get it fixed here. Oh, I do here. Yeah.
Now, why don't you guys stay up front here? Elizabeth, come here. Come over to Dad, Elizabeth. Come here. Come get me. Over here, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, why don't you jump for me? You jump. Yeah, you good jump. Jump more. Good jump. Go jump for Dad. Keep on jumping. Come on, jump. Now, one foot at a time. One foot, like this. Go back on the lawn and do that. Go back there and do it for me, okay? Show me how you do like this, right? Show me how you do this. Go back on the lawn and do that. Go ahead. Show me, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, show me how you do that. Go ahead. Come on, jump. Keep on jumping. Come on. Come on, Elizabeth. Well, show me how you jump for it. Slowly. Look at me. Come on, Patrick, stop. Look at me. Look at me, Patrick. I no. Um, Who looks smashing? I look smashing. Who else looks smashing? Patrick. Yeah? Turn around here, Elizabeth. Point to Patrick. Who looks smashing? Yes. Yeah. Who? He. Well, you go tell Patrick he looks smashing too. He. Tell him, Patrick. Don't do that. Stand back up there. Elizabeth, you tell Patrick. Who looks smashing? Yeah. He looks smashing too. I like to be It's all over. She's done it. Chris Everett Lloyd wins her sixth U.S. Open Championship. This is Chris Everett Lloyd. I'm on the team that always wins. It's United Sciences of America. Join me and hit your financial ace now. Bill Rogers. Bill Rogers wins the New York Marathon for a fourth consecutive year, and he did it in grand style and with confidence. He again proves he's the best marathoner in America, perhaps the best marathoner in the world. Winning a marathon or winning in life, there's one thing they both have in common, a winning attitude. That's why I joined United Sciences of America. This unique company is dedicated to improving the lives of millions of Americans and providing them with financial security. So join the winning team. Steve Garvey at bat, one on, one out. There it is, going, going, and it is gone, and so is the ball game. Steve Garvey almost single-handedly sends the Padres to the world if you want to win the World Series, you have to believe in yourself and take advantage of opportunity. That's why I joined the USA team. Their success system can make each associate a major leaguer. So join me on the winning team, now. From San Francisco to Miami, from New York City to Southern California, from the courts of Wimbledon to the Boston finish line, these great American champions are part of a national movement that's now yours and mine. I'm William Shatner. If you've been waiting for that big break, this is it. Have your dreams outgrown the reality of your job? Are you tired of limits on your income? Waiting for a raise that never comes or is never enough? As a salaried worker, no matter how good your pay and benefits, you're always at the mercy of a single employer. You can be dismissed at any time. And when that happens, it's almost always a catastrophe. Then think about this. When you're the boss, you have control. 
You have the freedom to decide your own income, your own working hours. You never have to punch someone else's time clock. Picture yourself living in the home you've always wanted to live in, driving the car you've always wanted to drive, or simply having enough money to care for loved ones. United Sciences of America takes pleasure in sharing with you a part-time or full-time business opportunity. It's as easy as ABC. Remember what billionaire J. Paul Getty said about amassing wealth? Simply manufacture major consumable products that everyone uses repeatedly, but make them better and for less money. Also, I would rather earn 1% of the efforts of 100 men than 100% of the efforts of myself. This is the essence of United Sciences of America Incorporated. The company has developed scientifically documented products for a nation clamoring for better health and greater vitality. And USA is offering you the ground floor opportunity to be part of an American legend in the making. The USA Marketing Plan was created by the finest group of business professionals in America today. People like Jerris Leonard, the former Assistant Attorney General of the United States of America, and Dr. Mark Albion of the Harvard Business School. Professor Albion holds doctorates in both business and economics and is frequently called upon as an expert by programs such as 60 Minutes. Mark Albion teaches at the Harvard Business School. He's written extensively on advertising and its effects. I've been at Harvard for nearly 15 years. During that time, I've consulted for many Fortune 500 companies, including AT&T, Coca-Cola, Nabisco, and IBM. Yet I've never been so impressed with a company as I am with United Sciences of America, Inc. This organization, its talent, its integrity, its plain, simple commitment to excellence is unsurpassed in American business today. The advertising and marketing package is unique, state-of-the-art. Anyone who uses this package properly will become very successful. I feel that United Sciences of America will capture significant share in the multi-billion dollar nutrition market. But more importantly, this organization will open up brand new markets to those of us who are becoming increasingly conscious of our health and the quality of our lives. With the medical and scientific credibility, United Sciences of America is destined to become the IBM of nutrition. The backbone of the American free enterprise system is the independent business owner. Let's compare the USA opportunity with your other options. When people talk about going into business for themselves, often they don't realize the scope of the responsibility. It usually takes all of your savings, even mortgaging your home to get started. Then you have long, hard hours with little time off. There's the high costs of advertising and promotion, the high costs of monthly overhead, wages, utilities, insurance, unemployment taxes, problems in hiring, training, and keeping competent employees. The list goes on and on. United Sciences of America eliminates these pitfalls and offers you a profitable program with security, stability, and integrity without the risks. The USA Marketing Plan was based on the runaway best-selling book, Megatrends. Author John Nesbitt, predicting trends in the future, presented a new philosophy. Nesbitt called it networking and wrote, Networks emerge when people are trying to change society. One of networking's great attractions is that it's a vehicle for connecting people with one another, for talking to each other, for sharing ideas, information, and resources. Networks exist to foster self-help, change society for the better, improve productivity and work life. A plan was developed that duplicated the success technique used by most great corporations of America. These companies build one successful location, then another, then another, and take an ongoing share of the profits of each. In our program, you can achieve the same result by sponsoring other motivated, hardworking people into USA and earn a monthly royalty on the sales of all these new independent sponsors. This is network marketing. It's an incredible opportunity for both the company 
and its associates to grow together. Let's suppose you know five people who want vital health and financial freedom. Then, in turn, each know three people who seek the same. Your financial networking family is now 20 people. If those people each know two people, your financial networking family is now 50. Each of these levels is called a generation, and you don't have to be a mathematician to understand that the profits are potentially staggering because the growth is geometric. Best of all, though you may only have personal contact with your first or second generations, your organization can be as large as your ambition. So how do you get involved? Every USA Associate starts the same way. You are sponsored by another USA Associate, and you can purchase a company success system which contains everything you'll need to start your own independent business. Now you are in business for yourself, but not by yourself. Behind you stand many talented, devoted people committed to helping you succeed. Supporting you and your organization is a very powerful parent. United Sciences of America, Incorporated. We keep in touch each month with a fact-filled copy of the company's USA Update magazine and will continuously share new secrets for helping you expand your business. This four-color illustrated magazine keeps the spirit of the network alive and provides you with the latest findings on subjects important to your health. We live in the age of information. That's why the company will use a variety of exciting methods to keep you motivated with support and information you'll need for financial growth and success. This includes your individualized USA computerized bookkeeping system, newsletters, audio and video programs, and much, much more. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, no man can sincerely try to help another without helping himself. Join me on the winning team, the USA team. Join me now. Join me now. Join me and be a part of my championship team now. United Sciences of America, it's here at last. United Sciences of America wants you to join the team. Do it now. This is William Shatner. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hayward Nishioka and I'd like to share with you a few thoughts on what we coaches think are some of the qualities that go into the making of those special breed of people that we call champions. To do this, I've selected a different format, one that I think will be of interest to parents, coaches, and athletes alike. Rather than a step-by-step how-to tape, this presentation conceptualizes and names some of those ideas that we previously had about judo, but never quite expressly identified. But now, here they are in your edition of Star Power Judo. After viewing this tape, parents should have a better grasp of what they may want to support in their child. Coaches will have to turn their direction to different drills and training methods that will build us future champions. For the athlete, well, the athlete will know what he will have to do to attain star power judo.
How hungry are you? Do you look for every opening and opportunity to attack? Are you aggressive? Can you fail at one attempt and instantly go on to attack again and again then again? If you're knocked down, does it set you back? Or can you shrug it off and keep going like a machine? Is there a burning desire inside your existence that will not let you take defeat? That will not let you accept a loss? That keeps you on the offensive? That constantly searches for a weakness in the opponent? Or is it an opponent? Or is it the enemy? As you prepare to do battle, do your hands sweat? Does your mouth feel dry? Does your stomach feel like it's turning upside down? Are you visited by the menacing unseen cloud of death that seems to surround you? In spite of this, do you still look across the mat searching out the enemy whose very existence is causing you this distress. And as your eyes meet, will they be passive, defensive, or will they be aggressive? Will you have the hungry eye? Visualize yourself a champion. Visualization creates hope. It's the setting of the goal. It's the mental manifestation of where you want your physical self to get to. It's the ending point that is the starting point. The will to win. There's a certain something that champions possess, if only but for a short moment when they win. It extends beyond luck, for no one can be so lucky so many times as to end up a champion of their state, their country, their union, the world, or for that matter, the Olympics, after so many bouts. Each judoka digs deep into their existence at every practice in preparation for winning. Every practice is a building block for the edifice to be eventually erected. Each tournament is a testament to the results gained in practice. While some may see only tugging and pulling, the educated eye views movement created by one person's will to bend that of another as poetry in motion. Unlike the herky-jerky movements of novice, advanced players display guile, agility, power, skilled movement, looking for an opening, from which to move one's body in position for a throw, a pin, a choke, or an armbar. And these calculations are made in the wink of an eye as to when to attack, defend, go, stop, jump, slow down, speed up, turn, wiggle out of, crawl, stay inside, force to the middle, go left, go right, stay up, go down. The human puzzle of two bodies in motion, trying to overcome the other in a brief five-minute battle, is indeed a thing of beauty. It reminds one of the rawness and simple equation of existence as a prize given to the fittest. It conjures up images of animals in battle over territory, or salmon struggling upstream to ensure its progeny. What nobler way to display man's quest for some form of perfection than to test the human will to win against that of another. Champions love what they do. If they do it right, the endorphins or natural opiates of the body flow and it feels great. Great to throw, great to pin, great to choke, great to armbar, great to have control over our environment great to have tried our very best. In the movie City Slicker, Jack Palance, who plays a crusty old cowhand, raises his index finger in explaining to a couple of dudes, everybody's got to find this. If judo is your this, you've got to love it. And maybe even for a brief period in your life, it has to be the all-consuming number one thing in your thoughts and action. If you can do it here, you can do it there.
and anywhere. You can concentrate your energies, focus on life's problems, love, love life. Total commitment. The question that arises at the Olympics or the World's Championships for any contestant are the same as those found at any local tournament. When should I attack? After all, the opponent is resisting, is moving, is bigger, is stronger, is a champion. How do I get through his defenses? What do I do? Ulysses S. Grant once said, when in doubt, fight. In a match, the opponent is not always at his utmost best. There are moments of weakness in his movement that can be overcome by the moments of strength in our attacks, but they don't come about by being passive. When we enter a technique, it's total commitment time. There is no room for doubt or fear of failure. Just go! class judoka seemingly have turbo power. They'll enter into a throw and maybe stop, then suddenly burst ahead with a second kick, overcoming the resistance of the opponent. Others may even come out of an attempted throw and immediately re-enter to finish off the opponent. Why does this work? Well, sometimes a competitor, once having blocked an attempted throw, thinks it's over and there's a brief moment of relaxation. This relaxation may be ever so slight, but just enough for this stellar competitor to find a weakness in the opponent's armor. The body must instinctively tread on ground where lesser judoka have opted not to go. The advantage of grip and go judo is apparent as many top level competitors can attest to. The onset of a match or beginning of a regrip is a weak moment to be capitalized on. Since the mid 1960s, when judo became an official Olympic sport, new techniques have made it possible to effectively throw immediately upon gripping the opponent. One handed grips also are used to upturn opponents. Osotogaris, Ouchigaris, Haraigoshis, and Morotegaris have been applied off the grip. One arm Ippon Seonage and one arm Tayotoshis have also worked well. Judo under adverse conditions. Judo under ideal conditions would go something like this. You step up to compete, bow, grip hold of your opponent, he freezes, and you throw him for ippon. Step back, bow, and step off. On the other hand, judo under adverse conditions happens when you have to perform when all seems to be going wrong. It's when your opponent is quicker, taller, stronger, shorter, heavier, it's when you can't get an angle of entry. It's when he's throwing you and you're going to squirm out of it or even to attempt a low level counter. It's when you're being arm barred and you've got only 10 seconds left but your arm's about to go. It's during all the seemingly impossible situations that competitors perform under. But perform you do. Combinations. Fake left, then go right. Attack to the back, and when they lean to the front, throw them to the front. That's the nature of combinations. 
It's a means by which to misdirect the opponent's energies in one direction and to hit them from the unguarded side or the overcompensated weak side. Examples of this can be seen in Ouchigari to Uchimata. Usually the techniques are of a type that can flow from one to the other. Obviously a Tomoe Nage to Seo Nage is out of the question. Almost every major player has at least one of these combinations that he keeps up his sleeve. Combinations are not limited to standing techniques, but also can be seen in mat work, where a myriad of combinations can flow one technique to another. Waza or favorite technique. Every major player has a favorite technique. It's the one where the other guy can run, but he can't hide. It's the one you've practiced for months to program your muscles and nerves to find the opening. Even if the opponent were to escape, it's the move that he has to worry about. And if they're looking for the Tokui Waza, you hit them with the other Tokui Waza. It was reported that Kimura Masahiko, one of Japan's greatest judoka, would practice nothing but one-arm shoulder throws. In tournaments, he would drag his unwilling victims to the center of the mat, and while his opponent knew what he was about to do, he would slam them to the mat with his Ippon Seoenage. Later, he took it easy as he added to his repertoire the Osotogari. Now, when they resisted to the backside, he threw them to the backside with the Osotogari. If you saw a dollar on the ground, would you stoop to pick it up? If you saw a chance to throw, would you try? How about a pin, or a choke, or an arm bar? Well, would you believe that in the past, there were contestants who would pick up the dollar, attempt the throw, but pass up the pin, choke, or an arm bar? Why, you ask? Well, that's the way it was in the 50s, 60s, and 70s especially in the U.S., where not too many people were well-versed in mat techniques, much less understanding the subtleties of making a transitional move to mat work. In Europe, they were trying to find a way to beat the inventors of this wondrous sport of judo, while in the U.S., we were busy mimicking what we felt to be perfection. The Europeans started with a weak link in judo, and that was mat work. Not only did they create new pins, they created ingenious ways to enter into pins, chokes, and arm bars. What is interesting to note is that these transitions to this day do not have names, and for the most part, go relatively unnoticed. Only with the advent of video do we really see the beauty of these transitional moves. Slow motion, replay, and still buttons enable us to study the various moves at our leisure. In doing so, we can see that the transition from standing to mat occurs in many ways. Some moves are instantly transformed into point-getting techniques, while others are control-oriented, where the competitor first gains anatomical advantage over his opponent, and in a series of stages moves into a pin, choke, or arm bar. Because these moves have never been identified, only the initiated really have access to understanding them. But now, you're initiated. Do the unexpected. Mercurial's the word. Look it up. That's what many champions are. That's what you must be. Fake left, go right. Be noted for a certain throw one year and do something altogether different the next year. Prepare to be unpredictable. Keep your opponent on edge. Change up on him. Do the impossible. Do the never-before-seen techniques. Act weak when you're strong, strong when you're weak. And when he finally expects you to be unpredictable, do the predictable. 
Maybe. When can you say that you've ever been this happy? Have you ever had anything in your life that you could say could make you rejoice in this manner? Have you ever worked at a throw in practice that suddenly appeared out of nowhere in a tournament against an unbeatable opponent? Have you ever planned out a strategy and followed it through to a successful conclusion at a major event against, let's say, a world champion? What's it feel like? What's it feel like to be the best? What's it like to get a throw on a person that weighs 70 pounds more than you? I'd say that's cause for rejoicing. Some rejoice outwardly, while others digest their success in their hearts. After you've invested so much in your preparation, gone to the tournament site, waited an eternity for a match whose outcome was now to be finally unraveled in a brief four or five minute match, you bow, you grasp, you attack, you win, you celebrate. Though the feeling lasts just but for a few seconds, the memory of the win will remain for the rest of your life. Ah, isn't it just great? is mainly an area where it's a matter of time or submission. There is very little subjectivity to it, other than possibly to decide whether a never-before-seen pin qualifies as a pin or not. If it does qualify as a pin and the announcement is made of osaikomi or hold down, then it's a matter of 30 seconds. 30 seconds equaling a ippon, or full point win. 25 to 29 seconds, a half point, or a wazari. 20 to 24 seconds, a yuko, or a superior advantage. And 10 to 19 seconds, a koka, or a technical advantage. In arm bars and chokes, it's a matter of tapping twice. If your opponent taps twice, then he has given up. If he doesn't tap twice, then you have the option of dislocating the arm or choking him unconscious. It's pretty clear cut. So if you have an opponent who's weak on the mat and the referee who seems to prefer the other fellow over you, try mat work. It's almost a sure bet that he won't say wazari when your opponent taps out. Newaza or mat work skills are traditionally divided into pins, chokes, and arm bars. Modern judo requires knowledge of transitional moves and body management as well knowing how to stick to the opponent's roll with him, tuck, cling, and an array of other moves are essential to winning. Should you decide not to use mat work, it will be all the more difficult for you to win. In the 1992 Olympics, half the Ippon wins in the women's division were won by mat work, and about 28% of the Ippon wins were by mat work in the men's division. So why be half a judoka? Mat work could save your game. Things that affect the mind affect the body. If you think you're happy, your body is usually in good health. If on the other hand, you hold no opinion and you don't feel one way or the other, and four or five people approach you and tell you you don't look too well, you begin to feel down. 
You may even get sick. If you believe them, what do you do? Be positive. Change your environment. Stay around winners. They'll be your support group. By osmosis, you'll think like a champion. You'll be a champion. Think positive. Isn't it funny how we think and act like those around us? If we stick around losers, the likelihood of success diminishes. If we stay around champions, our likelihood increases. So stay around winners. Be a champion. I think, therefore I am, is a good statement to begin with. All things seem to emulate from just the thought. For example, at the turn of the century, if someone were to have said to you, man could fly, you would think they were crazy. But today, man flies at more than 1,500 miles an hour. In the realm of judo, what of winning a match without a pin, choke, or an armbar, or a throw, or even a decision win? Naoya Ogawa of Japan did it in 1991 and again in 1992. He, perhaps in the beginning he wanted to see if he could do it. He did. It was all on penalties. First he caused his opponent to step outside, then twice to stay in the red zone for more than five seconds, thus winning his match without even throwing, pinning, choking, or armbarring. To a lesser degree, cerebralizing your judo may be just a simple act of studying your opponent's strengths and weaknesses to avoid his strengths and to capitalize on his weakness. Like, if he's good on the mat, work him standing, or vice versa. If he likes to go left, you go right. Cerebralizing may go so far as to even know the quirks of the referee and to play them as well. It's also knowing where you stand in the pairings and to make mental preparations for the ensuing battles. It's the what do I do if plan. And remember, anything you can cerebralize is possible, if you think about it. Some view losing as having been killed in battle. Some lose and laugh it off. Some lose and laugh and cry inside. Some lose and are good sports. Some lose and cry. The serious lose and cry. In practice, we all have our nemesis. It's that guy who can throw you at will, who makes you think about him all the way home. It's like that gnawing feeling of an unresolved argument where you could have said certain words and gotten even, but you didn't. Next time, you'll try harder. You resolve in your mind you're not going to be thrown. Damn, he threw me again, but it was harder for him. Next time, you resolve in your mind and your body not to be thrown. Hmm, he got me again, but not as effectively. Next time, you frantically search every corner of your being, resolve not to be thrown. Ah, success at last. And it works. It works with everyone whose resolve to throw is weaker than your resolve not to be thrown.
There are pins where the opponent's weight seems unbearable as he crushes your chest in. Or he squeezes your head till you look like the face on an Anderson commercial. Most certainly arm bars seem inescapable. Yet there are those who get out. Are they lucky? Super strong or what? They're the ones who combine know-how and willpower. They're the ones who feel the weight of the opponent but work through the maze of arms and legs and body, moving this way and that way, jockeying for position, inching a leg in here, an arm there, a twist of the body here, and eventually they work free. Sometimes it's just sheer power, overcoming the power of the opponent. Other times it's willpower, overcoming the willpower of the opponent. Some counter moves are executed so quickly that the untrained eye and sometimes the trained eye may not catch the technique. But that shouldn't stop you from trying this indispensable tool for winning. Counter moves are defensive tactics that rely on the opponent's initial attack. Once the attack has been stopped or has failed, there's usually a hasty retreat. If the retreat is an unguarded one, then that weakness can be taken advantage of. Many of the counter moves are pre-planned and anticipated, but there are some counters that act out of the sheer need of the moment. In any event, counter moves have one great effect on the opponent. They create caution and indecision. Now he's psychologically at a disadvantage since he cannot fully commit to a technique attempt in fear of the counter move waiting in the wings. Are you really hurt? No, are you really hurt? Did anything inside of you sound like a Rice Krispies commercial? Did something inside of you tell you that something was dreadfully wrong? Then it's time to stop. We all aspire to martyrdom. It's the Hollywood thing to do. If the injury isn't too bad, we can do it. We can do it like the little red caboose. And if we can't, well, what do you expect? I'm injured. And if I win, I did it in spite of my injuries. The problem with injuries is that they can be symptomatic of a mental injury as well as a physical one. So I ask you, are you really hurt? No, are you really hurt? If you are, stop. Can you do your judo while you're upside down? Can you, while being thrown, think and react to counter the move? While tumbling and tossing, can you still be calm and see an opening? Champions can. Whoever gets their grip first usually will have the advantage. That's if you can maintain it and attack from it. That's why so much of today's training and thoughts go into grip fighting. There are a myriad of gripping styles to choose from today. In addition to the basic right hand or left handed natural grips, there are cross grips, one handed grips, double lapel, double sleeve, one sided grips, belt grips, and many others. Not only are there grips, but also there are step-by-step -step methods of getting the grip that you desire. Furthermore, cutaways and grip releases also add to your advantage. 
All are designed to place the opponent in a disadvantageous position from which he may be weak and you strong. When you're in a bad position, you can feel it. When you do, you've either got to break the grip and regrip or suffer the consequences. Grips should be used not just for defense but mainly for offensive purposes. A certain bend or extension of the arm should be a cue for an attack rather than a defense. Everything starts from a good grip. You're ahead by a technical advantage or a coca. There's less than a minute to go, and you don't want a chance getting thrown, and you don't want a chance getting a penalty for non-combativity. What do you do? Go to the edge, execute a good non counterable throw, and go to the mat. If you're in luck, you'll end up on top. If you are on top, work him. If you're underneath, stall. If you get in trouble, roll to the outside with the Oops, I didn't know the line was so close, look. When we were kids, we'd walk on the cement edge of a curb and try not to fall off. Or perhaps skip from rock to rock, balancing ourselves as we forded a stream. With judo, the curb moves and the rocks, they try to throw you. In judo, we try to keep our balance while upsetting the balance of the opponent. And this is supposed to happen while we push and tug each other. It's a constant search for supremacy, feeling the opponent's movement and weaknesses and shifting away to higher ground and coming out with the upper hand. Body balance for judo is like surfing only the balance has to be maintained while reacting to the opponent's movements instead of the surfboard reacting to the curl of a wave. It's your internal gyroscope that puts you on top after all the twists and turns have been completed. If your opponent is a national champion and you're only a white belt, if he looks like the Terminator in a judo gi and you're only the 130 pound weakling, what's going to be your strategy? Well, divide the match in half. Fight the first half defensively. It doesn't even matter how many penalties you might get for stalling short of a hansokumake or penalty loss. The second half, fight your heart out. This is indeed a better way of fighting than to go out and be thrown in the first 10 seconds and not to have learned anything about your opponent for the next time around. Who knows, you may even win this time. In the 1992 Olympics, a little-known player from Canada beat the odds and became a major star. His first opponent from the Netherlands, Ben Spikers, had a wasadi on him. He now needed an ippon to win. This was almost an impossible feat to accomplish in the Olympic Games. A lesser player would have given up early in this match. But with less than two minutes to go, undaunted by the odds, Nicholas Gill came on with attack after attack, scoring two yukos, and in the last few seconds of the match, was finally able to take his opponent down, not for the ippon, but for a wazari, but enough to put him ahead in the match. Later, he was to face off with the 1991 world's champion, Hirotaka Okada of Japan. In the 60 kilogram division, equally as impressive was Nazim Guzinov of the unified team going against Dashgambo Butalga of Mongolia. Butalgo led early on in the match, scoring with a Yuko and then later following up with a Koka. It looked like the curtain had fallen on Nazim Guzinov. Guzinov, however, had other plans in mind. He wasn't about to just lay down and die. Instead, he kept on fighting. And fighting he did as he continued to badger his opponent, moving from one technique to another, finally causing his opponent to make a mistake and be penalized. Although Dashgambo Butalga had put a dent in Gusinov's plan, Gusinov 
had one thought in mind and one thought only, and that was to win over his opponent. Finally, an opening, then an attack, a score, and finally a win over his opponent, Butalga of Mongolia. Now returning to the 86 kilogram division with Nicholas Gill of Canada going against Hirotaka Okada of Japan. Hirotaka Okada of Japan was the 1991 world's champion. There was no way that Nicholas Gill could beat Okada of Japan. Okada led off with a score of Yuko with his beautiful Tomoe Nage. Unimpressed, Nicholas Gill kept up the attack. Lo and behold, he knocks Okada down. No score. However, he continues to, to threaten Okada with various attacks. Finally, with less than a minute to go, Nicholas Gill snags Okada and turns Okada over for a Wazari. With less than a minute to go, tired and demoralized, Okada looks stunned. Gill adds insult to injury as he scores twice more and the last one with a Yuko in the last second. If only Okada had had the heart that Gill displayed, it may have been a five minute match rather than a four and a half minute match. At the world class level, we fight the odds. We have no idols. We have no heroes. It's only one human against another. From the USJI, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I hope that you have been able to glean something from this videotape presentation. Thank you very much, and see you again.